Good morning and welcome everyone to FPC Online. We are so happy that you are joining us here today for this worship service. I am Holly Stork. My husband David and I and our four sons have been members of this church and this wonderful fellowship of family for about 15 years, ever since we've moved to Oregon. Um, today, I am going to introduce some of our community life events. Despite being isolated, we want to make sure that you still feel connected and close to the church. If you're not a church member but worshiping, worshiping with us online, please pay close attention to all the ways that perhaps you could get involved or, or connect because we warmly welcome you to do so. Uh, coming up this week, we have CPR program. You might wonder, what is CPR? Well, it is Coffee with Pastor Richard and his lovely wife, Holly. You can get this on Zoom, and you meet with your church family. It's a way to stay connected at this time. We meet Wednesdays weekly at 7 p.m. And for those of you who might not be computer savvy, it's very simple. We have a wonderful office administrator, Scott Dixon, who'd be more than happy to walk you through it should you want to call the church office. And I'm going to share that number with you at 541-884-7781. And there'll be lots of other information on ways you can reach out. But do not be defeated by technology and fail to join us because it'll be um, enlightening and fun and a, a wonderful way to connect at this time. Um, to join that, that Zoom link, you click it. Um, it's in the Friday email that we send out. So if you're not on the church's email list, you contact the church office. Um, and it's the Zoom link. We send it out Friday, and we get again, we send it out on Tuesday to join us. So for those of you who know what's going on in the tech world, you just click join meeting and use our meeting ID, code, and password that are found in that news information. Make sure to turn your microphone on when you're speaking so we can hear the wonderful things and valuable things you have to say or contribute to the call. And if you need any help, again, please call Scott. He is a wizard at this, and he's warm and wonderful to work with. If you have a need for food or know someone who does, please call the church. We have a meal ministry twice a week. Uh, my son, one of the, uh, another member of the church, is part of that, and he finds great reward and satisfaction in being able to, to contribute to the church family and our community in that way. It's on Tuesdays and Thursdays where we cook a hot meal and we deliver it to people's homes. So uh, please make sure to call the church if this is something that you are in need of. Uh, reminder, the sermon outline and small group discussion questions are posted on the church website. Just scroll down the church's landing page and you'll see a button, click here, current series. You can print them off or you can save them on your computer or phone, however you want to <laughs> save paper. If you do not have a printer, we can also have you call the church and we'd be more than happy to mail the outline and discussion questions to you weekly. If God is using this series to help you through this time of adversity, let us know We'd love to hear from you. We are currently planning ahead for the day we can start meeting together, something we're all looking most forward to. We're working on worship events, outreach opportunities like Parents' Night Out to help families who need a respite from their terrific kids, and Vacation Bible School, Youth Group, Family Ministry, Outings and Events, the uh, picnic and worship experience that we have annually in the park that everyone looks forward to, and a kill the fatted calf celebration where we can finally gather together and at church for worship. What a wonderful and rewarding day that that will be. Uh, one annou last announcement per our weekly prayer time, we will be lifting up specific businesses in the area if you'd like us to pray for a, speci uh, for a specific business business and you don't see it, send it to us and we'll make sure to post it. We're going to try and take a photograph of that business so it has some name and brand recognition for you and we're going to be doing this weekly so we can cover as many businesses as possible in our community. We will also give you time to pray for this business, their family owners, and in a way that's meaningful to you and I know how grateful they will be. So if you would like to join us, stand and get ready to worship. Please, uh, in, your, in your home or office or wherever you might be watching, 
And now we're going to get ready to worship. And I think a wonderful way um, to start is to first give each other a big air hug and then greet one another. A big air hug. <laughs> Next, I would like to talk about a minute for ministry on the elder and deacon opportunities to serve. What is an elder or deacon? That's a common question, and sometimes by veteran churchgoers. They know they're important, and that's, that's one thing, but we'd like to describe a little bit more about the duties, responsibilities of those positions. Elders are the spiritual leaders of the church. They provide for the spiritual nurture of the congregation under the leadership and lordship of Jesus. Deacons, they're the heart of the church. They lead in overseeing the ministries of compassion and care for the congregation and the community. Some responsibilities, um, I'd just like to give you a few so you have a flavor for it. Um, for the elders, they uh, lead the various teams and committees for the church. They provide spiritual direction with a team of volunteers. And then deacons, they have... Um, they head up lots of the different committees and, and um, things that we do. For example, the food ministry is just one of the many ways that they do that, as well as visiting our uh, folks and members that are in the hospital and homebound. There's the list is um, long, uh, long and filled with good stuff. <laughs> the time commitment, it's only about 10 hours a month on average. The benefits of the service... Our, your service as an elder or deacon will deepen your walk with God and force you to seek out and grow in your knowledge of Scripture and in your love for God's people. The service will, develop, will determine and develop the leader within you. As you serve, you will discover all your current gifts and acquire new skills, practices, and ideas that will be transferable to other areas of your life, so it's especially rewarding. As you serve, you develop a close bond with those you serve. You will acquire new friends and experience a deep appreciation and love for others. You'll gain a greater appreciation for the body of Christ and the ministry of the church. As you impact others' lives, you will be blessed and be filled, filling others with hope for yourself and the world around you. Best of all, you'll get to spend lots of quality time with our terrific Pastor Richard. And what could be better than that? He is a rock star. So shout out to pa Pastor Richard right here. Please refer to the email and instruct them how to nominate people. Maybe set a cutoff date. Um, there are other benefits and ways that um, provide inspiration, and sometimes those are found quietly and on your own in, in how you serve. So we hope when you get the nomination form, or if you're seeking one through the church office, you will carefully consider this vital and important and loving responsibility for your church. Yes. 
through it all, through it all it is well. Through it all, through it all, my hands are hurt. It is well. every day, sometimes every hour, we, pay, we praise God for attributes, thanking him for his strength to get us through hard times. He has been faithful. He has sustained us in other times, and he will do it again this time. Lift up all those affected by this virus, healing for those who are ill, comfort for those who've lost loved ones, protection for all of those who are healthy and will remain healthy. We pray for the first responders. We pray for those most isolated. We pray for the local businesses. The Shelleys, El Palacio, and Leap of Taste. They're all downtown, and they are all still open for takeout. We invite people, you all to pray for businesses that you frequent and that are special to you. Never take for granted all those people who we intersect with in our life each day and make sure to remember them at this time. Now we pray for the family of Helen Weaver who went home to be with the Lord last Sunday. Pray for Heidi, Andrew, and Thomas Biggs. Comfort them as they grieve the very sudden loss of Heidi's dad and her hero, Tom Neal. Also pray for Heidi's mother. Please pray for the healing of three-day-old Caden Pittenger for a heart defect and provide peace for her very worried parents. At this time, I'd like to have a short pause where we lift everyone up in your own prayers. Now please join me in closing with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, at this time, I ask the uh, virtual ushers to come forward at this time. Again, if you've been with us, you know how to do this. Uh, just, just minimize the screen that you're on. Go to the church's website, click online offering, and give your offerings, and then come back and enjoy the music. If you write a check or you drop your offering off at the church, uh, maybe you want to write the check right now, and then just sit back and enjoy the music. May the ushers come forward at this time.
Father, we come before you and we thank you for uh, all your gifts. You are a God who, uh, despite how it may look sometimes, you are in control. Uh, you are sovereign. Uh, you love us. You give us the power we need through to face hard times. You have gotten us through hard times. You will continue to help us through hard times. You will help us through this time and through future times. So we thank you for for your sovereignty. We thank you for your strength and your help and the power that faith gives us to face all things and not just face them, really to learn from them, benefit from them, and thrive. So we, we thank you for that. Thank you for your grace that's been kind of poured out on our lives. All the gifts, all the things you've blessed us with. Uh, we do really do have a great life. Uh, most of our lives are lived pain-free. We do have episodic times of difficulty or hardship. And even in those times, you help us to get through it. So help us, help the, maybe these dark times not to block out the reality that uh, above the clouds, the sun is always shining. And through this event and past this event, the sun will rise again. And we will get through it and life will return to normal. So we look forward to that day. We pray now that you'll use these tithes and offerings so that we may express to others and show to others uh, the love of God and the power of faith that will help them get through this time. Uh, use us as well to spread that same message and be a demonstration of your love and grace. Prayed. Amen. All right, today we continue our series, uh, kind of face adversity, face hard times, uh, face difficult times. Last week, we looked at Daniel chapter 3, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, kind of the fiery furnace, the ordeal that they faced is a reminder to all of us that we have, we are, and we will face times of adversity. It's just kind of part of life. Uh, what will help us get through those times, help us face times of adversity, uh, is faith. Uh, faith in God alone. Not a faith that is dependent upon a particular outcome, but a faith that is in God alone. To have faith that is dependent upon a particular outcome in order to believe is like, you know, is really turning God into Santa Claus. Now, kids, if you're out there, you believe it or not, there are some adults who have lost faith in Santa. And the reason why, and if most adults who've lost faith in Santa lost it because there was a time in which they sent a letter to Santa with a particular gift that they wanted, and Santa failed to deliver it. So they lost faith of him as a result. And a lot of people kind of treat God that same way. Um, they have faith in God as long as God delivers the goods. And when he no longer delivers the good, which is what happens when you experience adversity, it's God simply withdrawing his benefits from our lives. Uh, faith dissipates. Faith evaporates. That kind of faith will not help you get through a crisis. It will not help you make it through this pandemic. The kind of faith that will is a faith that is in God alone. And in last week's story, we saw how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced death, even a, a fiery death, a painful death, uh, faced down the most powerful person on the planet and was able to stand up for good and for what was right in the face of opposition, in the face of the fact that everyone else was bowing down, they still stood up for what was right. That's the power of faith. Today we're going to look at the question of why. Why do we go through hard times? Uh, why does God permit suffering? Why does God permit tragedy? I mean, if he's all good and all powerful, why doesn't he just stop it? 
There's probably no better place to go that will give us clarity and the help we need to get through this time than the book of Job. Uh, There is no book in the Bible or really any piece of literature that addresses the issue of pain and suffering with the philosophical intellectual depth, the emotional realism, and the spiritual wisdom than the book of Job. Uh, it's little things about the book of Job was written at the same time of Genesis, which is interesting. Uh, which means that we have been grappling with this problem for a long, long time. We have asked the question of why suffering, since suffering entered into the world. Uh, the book of Job is also written in the form of a play. It's a six-part play. It begins with a short dialogue between God and Satan. Then most of the book is comprised of these long discourses and dialogues between Job and his friends who are trying to give him comfort, but not doing a really good job at it. And then the the book ends with a conversation between God uh, and Job. And from the very beginning, the very first chapter, which is what we're going to look at, just a couple verses in the first chapter, we receive incredible insight and advice on how to handle adversity and what to do about it and how to handle the question of why. So here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to his face, to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another messenger came up and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they were dead, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you will just enlighten us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through your word, and give us an understanding as to the why of suffering and what do we do about it and what do we learn from this passage that will help us face this time of adversity, face this pandemic and the other future ones. Show us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed. Amen. I think the f- when it comes to the question of why, I think the first thing that you want to do is avoid kind of simplistic answers or, kind of, or pat answers. I know there are two common responses to this question uh, that you will hear. One I, is called the religious one. The other one is kind of the, the cynical one. The religious response is, you know, if you experience pain and suffering in your life or times of adversity, you've got to ask the question, well, what did I do wrong? Um, the assumption is, if you do good in your life, only good things will happen. And, but if you do bad things in your life, then bad things will happen. So if you're suffering, it's because clearly you've done a bad thing. 
Uh, there's another version of this in our culture is called the belief in karma. Karma basically says, uh, not only, I mean, if you're suffering, it could be not only for something you've done in your current life, it might have happened as a result of something you've done in your past life. The Christian version of this is the belief that bad things happen as a result of sin. Perhaps there, or there must be some unconfessed sin in your life. Or there's something you know you're doing wrong that you're doing, and as a result, bad things are happening to you. Or it may be not a sin of commission, but a sin of omission. There's something you should be doing uh, that you're not. Or, some Christians explain it this way, the reason why you may be experiencing hard times is because of something you're doing, but you're not doing it hard enough or sincere enough. You're not praying hard enough. You're not giving enough. Uh, you don't a attend church often enough. You don't believe hard enough. I know when I was a, at, at college, I went to a, a Christian college, I remember I was attending a chapel and I heard a speaker, you know, kind of deal with this passage about, about Job. And he mentions this hedge of protection. And he says, you know what? The reason why Job experienced these terrible things in his life, why he suffered so much, is because he doubted. He, he lacked faith. Earlier in the book, in chapter 1, he's always praying for his sons and daughters, worried that they may sin against God. And they say that's evidence that uh, Job lacked faith. And because he lacked faith, the hedge of protection lowered, and it allowed the enemy to attack him and get at him. Uh, they it also explained Paul's thorn in the flesh this way. The reason why Paul experiences thorn in the flesh is because, and God explains it to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Meaning, in this person's... Uh, interpretation that, hey, God, God was saying, hey, Paul, I gave you all the grace you need. You have all the grace you need to claim your healing. The problem is you're not doing it. So the reason why he has the thorn in his flesh is because he lacked faith. Now, is that what that passage means? Well, no, if you read the passage really carefully, when God says, my grace is sufficient for you, what he's saying to Paul is, hey, my grace will give you the strength you need to get through your thorn in the flesh, which is something we talked about last week. Huh? God doesn't always save us from the furnace. Most often he does, but not always. But there is something that God always does, and that is he always gives us the strength to face our furnace, to get through times of adversity. The cynical response says this, that pain and suffering, adversity, there's no rhyme and reason to it. It's completely random. You are simply in the wrong time, at the wrong place. Uh, life is really a crapshoot. You probably heard a slogan or seen on a bumper sticker. It uh, happens. You probably could fill, fill it in what it is. Uh, both view God differently. The religious response kind of sees God as this tit-for-tat type of God. Uh, that suffering is a result of, or, or the, the punishment of sin that he treats us according to our sins. Well, if you know the passage that it comes from, it's Psalm 103, you know that the passage actually says he does not treat us according to our sins. The cynical response uh, views God this way. Either God is non-existent, which is why things are so random, or if God does exist, the fact that people suffering or there is adversity in this world or evil in this world must mean God is too weak to keep it out or too uncaring or aloof or cruel or something even worse. That in reality, we have not a good God, but an evil God over this world, an evil God who's capricious. Because and clearly, this type of God isn't a God you, that's really worth believing in. Because really, if he really is, as the Christians say, all-powerful and all-good, and he still allows people to suffer, isn't that kind of cruel of him? What kind of person is that to allow people to suffer and die when they had the power to stop it? It doesn't make him good at all. So as a result, this, this God is not a God worth believing in. Job chapter 1 disputes both views. It, it, ta it says to both views, both the religious and the cynical view, that you are wrong. You're both wrong, and you're both spiritually unhelpful. Now, in chapter 1, it looks as if, 
You know, on the surface, God and Satan are kind of playing games. And we are kind of caught in the crosshairs. The reason why there's pain and suffering in the world is because of this cosmic battle between good and evil and God and Satan. But what chapter 1 actually is, says or is supposed to say to us, the point that's being made is it's telling us uh, God's relationship to evil and its cohorts. And the, its cohorts are disease, death, disaster, and disappointment. And here's what chapter 1 says about God's relationship to suffering or pain or evil in its cohorts. One is God does not cause pain. God does not cause suffering. He's not the author of it. Notice in the passage who instigates it. Well, Satan instigates it. It was his idea. It was his doing. Uh, there is, whether you believe it or not, evil in this world. Um, it comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If you read Genesis chapters 1 to 3, what you discover is when God created the universe, he did not weave into his creation pain and suffering. Pain and suffering are an intrusion on it. Uh, it's, a, it's a violation of his creation. God did not create a world in which strong winds knock down four walls and kills an entire family. That's not the world that God created. Uh, tragedy, evil and its cohorts, are the result of human rebellion, Scripture says. And as a result of our rebellion, it unleashed uh, evil into this world, and with evil came this, these destructive forces. Things no longer function the way God wanted them to, the way they should. Uh, this world is broken, but it's not how God designed it. And Scripture says all creation groans. You know what groaning is? Groaning is the sense of this is not the way it should be. This is wrong. And creation is right. It is wrong. It is not the way God designed it or created it. Do you remember what Jesus' response was to the death of Lazarus? Did he chastise Lazarus for sinning? The reason why you're dead, Lazarus, is because evidently you sinned. You did something so bad that you died from it. No, God didn't say that. Did God say, hey, Lazarus, the reason why you're in the grave is because you lacked faith. If you only believed in me and claimed your healing, you wouldn't be in there. Did God, Jesus say that? No. Did Jesus just shrug off his death? Well, it must have been his time. And doesn't he look nice all wrapped up in there? Is that what Jesus said? No. What Jesus did was, it says he wept. And I think that really is God's response and reaction to pain and suffering in the world. He weeps. I can see him kind of pounding on the window of heaven, just shouting out to us, this is not how I meant it to be. It's not supposed to be this way. So he suffers with us. He weeps with us. Kind of reminds me of the movie Interstellar. Uh, there's a poem they kept uh, reciting over and over again, uh, with the one scientist, in response to aging. And it comes from the poem by Dylan Thomas, Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I think that's a faithful response. I think that's a Christian response. I think that's how God responds. Uh, in an essay written in 2004, David Hart said this, in response to the tsunami that killed over 240,000 people, I can't imagine that. He said this. Our faith in is, in a, is in a God who comes to rescue his creation from the absurdity of sin and the emptiness of death. And so we are permitted to hate these things with a perfect hatred. As for comfort, when we seek it, I can imagine none greater than the happy knowledge that when I see the death of a child, I do not see the face of God, but the face of his enemy. It is a faith that has set us free from optimism and has taught us hope instead. My friends, pain and suffering are not caused by God. He did not weave them into the fabric of creation. It is not how he wanted things to go. And when we experience difficult times like this one, he weeps with us. But he also offers us hope. Uh, God has set a limit to this time. It will not go on forever. Uh, we will get through it. 
and things will turn to normal, there will be a day when you will sit in an office for 30 minutes to an hour before the doctor or the dentist or the DMV person calls your name. Uh, there will be a day when we will pack stadiums cheering on our favorite teams or listening to our favorite artist and buy exorbitantly priced hot dogs and beer. Uh, there will be a day where we will sit in traffic jams, except for Klamath Falls, because if you live in Klamath Falls, there are no such thing as traffic jams. Uh, there will be a day when you will hit the, the, uh, the clock buzzer for the second time before you get up, and you have to get up, get on your clothes, go to work, and go to school. And there will be a day where the only day in which you get to sleep is Sunday, but you will get up and put on your best clothes, and you will go to church. But this time will be different. You won't complain. You won't be upset by it. You'll praise God for it. The second thing we learn about God's relationship to pain and suffering uh, through the first chapter of Job is God is in control. Uh, Satan has to ask God to do anything. God has to give his permission. And in each case, though, God puts limits to Job's suffering. God puts limits to our suffering. It, God's relationship to suffering is he restrains it. Um, it won't last forever. It's usually just episodic, short period of time. He gives us the strength to bear through it. Um, if there were no God, the reality is things would be much worse. There would be no God to restrain evil in its cohorts. If God was really weak or aloof or uncaring, uh, things would be way worse because it would be a limitlessness to our pain and suffering. It's actually because of God's grace that it's limited. It's called prevenient grace. Uh, it's God's grace that sustains the world even though we don't deserve it. Uh, yeah, you might say, but, but God said to Satan, very well, you know, God let Satan cause Job to suffer. God permits it. And if God permits it, in our minds, it means God was directly responsible for it. So he's the blame. Well, think about this. Um, imagine you uh, borrowed the family car, and while you were out, you wrecked it. And you come home to tell your parents. Now, whose fault is it for wrecking the car? Imagine, now you, the response, of course, you. You wrecked the car. It's your responsibility. But what? imagine if you went to your parents and said, you know what? It's really your fault I wrecked the car because, hey, you gave me the keys. You know, imagine a criminal uh, robbing someone and then being caught and then hauled into jury, into, into the court. And to the surprise of the judge, the criminal says, you know, judge, I went off free first. But I also want to sue the victim because of the unsafe conditions of their home. And because their home is unsafe that while on the job, I got injured. Imagine if you were the judge, what would you say? Well, we do the same thing with God. You know what? Hey, we wrecked the car. We committed the crime. Uh, <laughs> we wrecked this planet. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. We did this. Uh, so if we blame God for that he permits these things, it's just like blaming your parents for letting you have the keys or, or uh, blaming the victim for keeping unsafe conditions in the home while you robbed them. God didn't author pain and suffering. He didn't weave it into the fabric. So then what does he do about it then? Again, he, he restrains it. Uh, he restrains suffering. And then while he's restraining, he's also redeeming it. The reason why Jesus came, why he gave his life on the cross, is so that we can have a relationship with God. He takes away our sin, opening up the possibility of a relationship with him. And once we come into relationship with, the, with him, our life changes. And, and now we're able to make better decisions, I and mean, those better decisions cause our life to go better, which reduces our suffering. And God is doing that not only in your life and my life, but every person's life, or he wants to do it in every person's life, so that one day as he, as he weeds out evil in every one of us, uh, life in this world will become better and better and better. This world will be a better place. That's the purpose of redemption. If you can picture this world as kind of a boat, God gave us a perfect boat, and then we went out and wrecked it. And ever since, uh, God has been sustaining. He's been keeping this boat afloat. 
He's been plugging the holes right and left, trying to make sure it doesn't sink to the bottom of the ocean. You know, it would, we would, it would be a lot better, you know, if we would help God. We'd kind of cooperate with God and help him patch the holes rather than pounding more into it. Imagine life as a piece of fabric. Uh, uh, when sin entered the world, when we rebelled from God, a, a terror started down the fabric of creation. And then you know, God could have just let it go. It could have just all came apart, but he didn't. He stepped in. He restrained the, uh, the terror. He stopped the terror from occurring more. And ever since, he's been weaving it back together little by little. Every time he saves someone, every time you give your heart and life to Christ, it's a way of God weaving back creation more and more to the degree that he begins to restore all things. And as a result, evil dissipates and, and good uh, uh, flourishes. That's God's desire. And again, it'd be a lot easier uh, if we would cooperate with God rather than make more holes or make wor the terror worse. I think the real question to the, uh, of why pain and suffering is not, you know, God, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? The real question is, why is there so much good in the world? I mean, think about that. If there really was no God, then what, to, what explains all the good that there is? Someone did a study, actually, and they looked at people's lives and they, the times where they go through adversity or pain and suffering and the amount of time they spend where life is pretty good is, is pain-free. Do you know what the percentage was? The percentage of time that we spend in really a pain-free existence. 95% of our lives. 95% of our lives are spent pain free We just go through these episodic times of, of personal suffering. Um, think about this virus. Think of this pandemic. When was the last pandemic? I mean, um, the kind of pandemic I'm going to talk about is the global pandemic that shut down churches and restaurants. When was the last one? 1918. Over 100 years ago. So for the last 99 years, we have faced no pandemic. It's, it's just this year. And it probably won't be in an, in, an entire year. So one out of 100 you, we experience times of adversity. Majority of the time, we don't. We don't. So why? What explains that there's so much good in this world? The answer is there is a God who sustains everything. Well, what, what, what will God do, though? You know, whether we cause it or not, what will God do in times of adversity? This is the third thing we, le we learn from the book of Job, the first chapter 1. God will defeat evil's intent. He turns evil on its head, and he accomplishes the opposite of evil's intent. Now, kind of stick with me on this one. Uh, uh, Satan said, or accused Job, of being a fraud. God allows suffering in Job's life. What was the result? He discovered that, you know, and Job discovered himself that he was not a fraud. He was a faithful follower of God. So there, where evil intended to destroy his faith, God used the suffering in his life in order to deepen his faith. Satan said, depended on God blessing his life and keeping this hedge of protection around particular outcome. Uh, the reality was no. Job's faith was unconditional. Uh, Satan said, Job is using God, and through pain and suffering, we discovered, no, Job loves God. Satan wanted to, Job to hate God, but his suffering caused him to fall deeper in love with God. God always takes and, and uses evil to accomplish the opposite of evil's intent. Uh, Satan wanted to steal, kill, and destroy uh, Job's life, at the end of the book, what you discover is Job lost nothing. Job is, everything in his life that he lost has been restored. He, his children are restored. Possessions, even more possessions than he had are restored. And everything he did lose uh, was kept in heaven for him. And there was a day, and there is a day, and he's already there, you know, where when he closes eyes on this life, he opened his eyes to the next, and everything he lost in this life was restored to him in the next. 
So the end result is, at the end of the day, Job lost nothing. God always accomplishes the opposite of evil's intent. As a result, Paul says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now notice what God will do in this passage in your life. It says that, hey, we live in a world uh, of decay. We are wasting away. You know, that's, that's the process of aging. We are wasting away. But God can take that wasting away and turn it around so that it accomplishes a daily renewing as you walk with God. God takes the troubles in our lives that can pull us down or pull us away from him and actually achieve in us, the passage says, an eternal glory. God always takes evil's intent and, intent and turns it on its head so it accomplishes the opposite of evil's intent. Uh, you look at the cross of Jesus. Uh, Satan already thought by killing Jesus that he'd put an end to God's plan. But in killing Jesus, he actually accomplished God's plan. It was Satan's intent in killing Jesus to, to damn the world, but actually he, he made it possible to the world to be saved, to go to heaven. Um, he came to kill, steal, and destroy by killing Jesus. He's hoping to kind of thwart all of God's plan and condemn the whole world, but it actually resulted in the planting of seeds that will one day germinate and put an end to all suffering. Scripture says this, never again, this is our future, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat them down, uh, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, you might still have a question in your mind. Well, if really... Uh, uh, suffering and pain are the enemy of God. Why doesn't he just stop it now? Why does he permit suffering to persist? Um, in 2 Peter uh, 3, 9, Peter answers that question by saying, you, you really, the reason why God puts off returning and kind of putting it into all this is because he's patient. He wants everyone to be saved. And I'm glad he's patient because imagine if he stopped the world before 1973, um, I wouldn't be saved. I wouldn't be going to heaven. Uh, imagine if he stopped it. At, at what point, think of your own life. At one point, what if God stopped it just before you met him? What a difference in your life would, it would be. Ultimately, the answer to this question is it's, it's a mystery. Uh, the book of Job says this whole question is a mystery. There's some things we do know, though. We do know that evil, pain, suffering, death, hard times, pandemics, Tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes are God's enemies. They're not part of God's creation. Uh, he never wove them into the fabric of this world. Um, if God really could just stop it, if he just yank it out right now, knowing God and his love and grace, I mean, he would do it. I mean, that God himself suffered that God himself had to die on a cross, what tells me that if all he had to do is yank out evil in the world and its cohorts, uh, he would never have to suffer. But he did. Why? Because it's just not that easy. Imagine um, evil in its cohorts. It's kind of like a tumor in your brain. But this tumor has tentacles that go all through the body. And all through the brain. Imagine what would happen if a physician just yanked it out. What would happen? It'd kill the patient. And I think that's the reason why God just allows things to go the way they are. Because if he just yanks it out, it would put an end to the world. It would kill the patient. But what God is doing is that as a master surgeon, he is slowly removing evil in his cohorts bit by piece. Bit by piece. Tentacle by tentacle. How's he doing it? by offering salvation to you, by offering to come into your life and killing evil in you. And if he kills it in you, and in you, and in you, and he kills it in everyone in your state, in your nation, in your family, imagine the kind of world we would have. Do you know who causes most of your pain and suffering? 
Do you know what causes most of the pain and suffering in the world? We do. They even think about this pandemic. If the reports are true, if it comes out that it was the result of scientists botching an experiment, playing around with a virus and botching it, not following proper protocol, it means this virus was started by people. And the motive was just to get ahead of the U.S. in scientific discovery and pharmaceutical pursuits. And then maybe the ultimate motive was greed. Imagine if that was the case. It would mean we caused this pandemic. We brought pain and suffering in this world. Now, there are a lot of people who are innocent as a result, who are suffering, who are innocent of doing it. Well, how do you handle that? Um, the answer is, uh, scripture says, walk by faith. It's a great song by Jeremy Camp. It talks about walking by faith, and that's not something he just says easily. He, he had to do it in his own life. If you see the movie, I Still Believe, I encourage you to go out and see it. It's a story of his life and how he lost his wife uh, to cancer. And what helped him get through it was walking by faith, knowing that that wasn't God, that was God's enemy. And God was still working and helping him get, get through that uh, loss in his life. He'll do the same thing for you. Uh, Job 38, 1 to 2 says this, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Through the entire book, Job has been, and, and his friends have been grappling with the question of why, why, why? And God never answers the question, but he does give us a little bit of information that helps us. He says, you know, when it comes to the question of why, uh, the reason why you can't get to that answer is because you lack information. There is data that's not available to us. Uh, in chapter 1, you get this conversation between Satan and God. It's just a way of uh, God saying in a kind of a picturesque picture way is that there are so many things happening behind the scenes that you don't know about that is behind the issue of pain and suffering and evil in the world. There is, there is information, but the data is inaccessible to us. As a result, we will never be able to answer the question of why. Not until heaven. Not until we see this, the full picture. And what Job is saying that this, this, this two verses in chapter 38 tells us is, one, the information we're looking for as to the answer of why is inaccessible. There's parts of the puzzle that are missing, so you'll never ever complete huh, this picture, which means there are no simple answers to this question. It means we need to avoid pat answers. It also tells us that with every experience of suffering in the world or pain and suffering or adversity in your life, every one of those has a different reason. And some of those reasons or causes are just beyond our perception, beyond our ability to know. Uh, and a, really a better approach, instead of banging our heads against the wall, asking why, 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 if, if really it's an unanswerable question, all we're doing is frustrating ourselves and driving ourselves crazy. I mean, have you ever had those dreams where you, you were trying to go someplace and you just could never get there? Or you were trying to do something, but you were, you were thwarted every time you just couldn't do it, and you wake up frustrated with a headache. I think that's how we are with trying to answer the question of why. Because the information we need to answer it isn't accessible to us. As a result, we can't answer it. So rather than being frustrated and angry over it, it's better to pour our time and energy in dealing with how. How do we get through it? One danger I see with the reality of there's no answer to this question, or no simple answer, is because we want answers, we manufacture answers, and oftentimes meaning to be or hoping to be comforting, we actually do more harm when we manufacture reasons that aren't really there. Now, all of you have probably lost loved ones. You know, if you've attended funerals. <laughs> you've been in a funeral of a loved one, and you, you remember some of the horrid things people say at funerals. Think of some of the things that people have said that you found, they thought that was comforting to you. You didn't find them comforting at all. In fact, they did more harm. They bothered you more than anything else. How about when people say, oh, doesn't he look nice? To the person who's in the coffin, the cadaver. The answer to that question is, no, 
he's dead, all right? Um, or things like, oh, but he's in a better place, or she's in a better place. I, that's comforting, yeah, but you know, I really prefer if they were here with me. How many of you felt that way? Uh, how many of you ever heard this poem that someone wrote uh, to explain why people die? God looked around his garden, and he found an empty place. He then looked down upon the earth and saw your precious face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. Now, I've heard people use this to bring comfort to parents who lost a child. And imagine hearing that poem is explaining why uh, their little child died. You know, I wouldn't believe in a God like that either. If God was really like that, if God really did that, I couldn't believe in a God like that. But I know God is not like that. The scripture says that death is an enemy, that he weeps. He wept over the death of Lazarus. He weeps over the death of a child. Um, and it says that God's the creator. You know, if God really wanted flowers for his garden, he could create them. He doesn't need your son. He doesn't need your daughter. He doesn't need your mom or your dad or your friend. He's the divine creator. He can create all the flowers he wants. That's not God. Death of his enemy, and he wants to get rid of it. I've heard also people say, well, the reason why they died was I guess it was their time. Their time was up. Uh, if it happened, it must be God's will. And I think this is a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. People think just because something happens that it has to be God's will. And so God is some divine control freak. He controls everything. But in reality, if you look at Scripture, does that say it at all? No. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things that happen in this world that are not God's will. Uh, death, pain, suffering are not God's will. They are a violation, an intrusion in God's perfect creation. He did not put them there. Going back to this passage, for we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, actually, if you think about it, if indeed... There's lots of information and things happening behind the scenes that's the reason for pain and suffering. It's inaccessible to us, so we can't know the answer or why. Then what this passage is telling us is not, this is how you should live. It, what it's really telling us is, you don't have any other choice. This is the condition of your life. You have to walk by faith. There is no other way of getting it through this. And it's not just faith uh, based upon a particular outcome, but it's faith in God alone. Now, why is that so important? Here's why. Uh, Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is really important to our salvation. For it is by grace you have been, faith, you have been saved, but it comes through faith. Now, how do you know you truly have faith? I mean, faith in God alone, not faith in a particular outcome, but faith in God alone. How do you know you have saving faith? Because your eternity rests upon it. But there's only one time you can know whether you have faith or not. You don't need faith in good times. You don't need faith in happy times. You don't need faith when you're living a pain-free existence. You only need faith when? When things go wrong. When you hit tough times, when you face an illness, or you face death, or you face a, a pandemic. I think in the book of Job, chapter 1, Satan really does hit on something. He is right about something. He accuses Job of loving God because of what God does for him. But God disagrees. He knows Job better than that, and he trusts Job more than that. So he allows Job to suffer, but what's the purpose of it? In order to show Job and Satan that he has faith, he has saving faith. And that whole experience of suffering actually produces in him an assurance, an assurance of his faith, of assurance of walking with God, of assurance of eternity. So though Satan wanted him to, to undermine his faith, it actually caused him to develop a greater assurance for his faith. And that will happen every time we face hard times and we get through it. We discover, hey, we got through it. 
God enabled us. And that builds up your faith and enables you to face the next time and the next time and the next time. And I think really what God's intent is to get us through so many times of hardship well as we walk with him that we are able to face the ultimate test, the ultimate, the ultimate enemy, and the ultimate time of adversity, which is our death. And God can, by taking the smaller um, periods of adversity in our lives, can use those to achieve evil's opposite intent. What evil wants to do is cause you to fear your death. And God will enable you to face your death and face it with complete and utter peace. The second thing we can do to, fa to face hard times, uh, one is walk by faith. Uh, second is embrace grace. Embrace grace. Uh, this is how Job saw his life and the blessings of God. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Notice all the wrong that's happened. He knows it's not God. God didn't do him wrong. That was Satan. That was evil. Um, but he says, naked I came in. I'm naked I depart. I'm, you know, he saw that everything he had was God's. All the blessings of God. You know, suffering really is simply the removal of God's blessing. When God removes our blessings from our lives, that's when we face times of adversity. He sees everything he has, his kids, his possessions, everything was God's. So if God decides to take him back, it's his prerogative. Because it was his anyway. They were just all unknown to him. Now, that's not how we normally respond to loss, is it? I mean, when you experience loss, how do you feel? Well, you feel angry. You feel bitter. You shake your fist at God. You're angry at him. How dare you take you what is mine? But if you see it as God's, on loan from God, and that it's his, and he has the right to take it away, it won't hurt so much. You say, hey, okay, hey, thank you for loaning them to me. I appreciate it. It really blessed my life. Now, so if you're the kind of person who sees what you have as yours, um, and then they belong to you because you earned them, uh, if what you have is a source of your joy, pride, and happiness— then here's what will happen to you as you go older and older. As you grow older and older, you will lose more and more. And that will make you sadder, madder, and worse. You'll get madder and madder, worse and worse. Because you, with every passing year, every passing day, you're pulled farther and farther from your source of joy. But, however, if you're like Job, who sees everything as a gift from God— <laughs> Uh, then as you age, you'll become better and better and gladder and gladder. And you'll go from grace to grace because with each passing year and each passing moment, you're being, you're being pulled toward, closer and closer towards your source of joy and pride. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10 and 17. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And that's what God will do in your life. Uh, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, meaning we're, we're, we're confused, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. We are always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For our light and momentary troubles, and that's really an interesting description that Paul would even call this pandemic, in light of God's strength and ability, in light of God's grace, it can become light and momentary trouble. It is achieving for us what will God do with it. It will achieve for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. And it probably is no greater expression of grace than the grace we see at the cross of Christ who died in our place. And, and through the cross, the cross tells us something about pain and suffering as well. One is the cross tells us that God trusts us more than we trust him. You know, in the Bible, there are three occurrences of where Satan accuses people or God. 
The first one is in Genesis, where, God, where Satan accuses God of holding back on Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve believe Satan's accusation against God and the rebel from God. Huh? And as a result, you know, evil and his cohorts entered into the world. You know, and people still believe that same lie today, that life without God is better than life with God. The second accusation is in the book of Job here, where Satan accuses Job as being a fraud. He only follows God because God benefits him. It's only because God's like Santa Claus to him. He's always doing wonderful things, and if God removes those wonderful things, if, if uh, God does not answer Job's prayers anymore and blesses him, that Job will turn his back on him. And Job refuses to believe that lie. God refuses to believe that lie about Job. Job's allowed to experience a short period of suffering in his life, and God has proved right, and Job was proved right, and Job's faith was affirmed, and Job was restored in every way. And you see this on, on, on the cross as well. Satan has the same accusation. These people aren't worth dying for, because you, you will suffer, and you will die, and they will turn their backs on you when you stop delivering the goods. You love pain and suffering in their life. You help things that go wrong. You allow them to face adversity. They will turn their backs on you. You know, the cross removed any reason for God to love us because to love us means he would have to suffer for us. But he does it anyway because he refused to believe Satan's lie. He trusts you and me. That He trusted that in going to the cross and dying for us, he trusted that as we see and, and experience God's love, we will respond in that same love back to him. Not for what he can do for us, but simply for him. Because of his love for us. That's the kind of trust that God showed for, on, our, on our behalf on the cross. The cross also is a reminder to us that of what God would do, does with evil and pain and suffering in the world. He will take it and turn it on its head. He will accomplish, accomplish evil's opposite, the opposite of its intent. Uh, they wanted to kill Jesus in order to thwart God's plan. It actually ended up accomplishing God's plan. Satan wanted to damn the world, but he also he actually made it a way that they could go to heaven. Everyone, all you have to do is receive Christ into your life. The cross also is a reminder of that death, disease, disaster, disappointment are God's enemies. Matthew tells us, by his stripes we are healed. Healing began on the cross. It continues today with every person turns to Christ in their life. God restores and the God pulls out the evil in us, making us a new people, better people. And by making us better people, we make better decisions. We treat other people better. We love neighbors as ourselves. We love others as Christ has loved us and it makes this place a better place and reduces suffering because most of the suffering is caused by us. And if we could stop harming each other and hurting each other and having proper motives, we would see a great improvement to this world. And also the cross is a reminder that it's, it signals evil's doom. The cross signals evil's doom. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, and there will come a day where everything will be made new. I close with the, just a, kind of a, 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 a movie I remember seeing called Inception. And in the movie Inception, uh, this guy kind of gets uh, lost in this dream. And he's at this place where he, before he was younger, now he's older. And it's been such a long time that his former life, that just this faint memory, this shadow, he can't even remember it. And I think the same thing happened in eternity. 5,000 years into eternity, all of our, all the stuff we've dealt with, all the times of adversity, all the hardships, all the struggles will be for us like this faint memory, this shadow. We're looking back, we're trying to think, what was it all about? We just can't remember anymore. Because time has passed for so long and life is now so good, it's absolutely perfect that it kind of wipes out the memory of any, any hardship we've ever experienced. 
You know, God does not give us a full explanation in Scripture as to the question of why. Why does suffering exist? Why does evil exist? But he does provide for us a final answer, and that is Jesus. I encourage you to embrace his grace. I encourage you to walk by faith, and if you do, you will get through this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the message in Job that when it comes to evil, it comes out my pain, my suffering, my struggles, you are not my enemy. Uh, you are not the cause. You are the solution. And you will do with evil as you've always done. All the hard times we ever go through, you will take it if we trust you and will turn it on its head so what is accomplished in our lives is the opposite of its evil intent. And you will bring good about as a result. And we will be better people, uh, kinder people, more compassionate people, people of stronger faith, people of greater integrity, which in turn will make this place into a better place. So help us to stop pounding holes in the boat. Help us to stop, stop tearing the fabric of this world and start joining with you in repairing it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service. We're going to close in song. Uh, but first, we have a, a treat for you. Um, Ted and Reen uh, Staggart are going to share with you uh, a time where they experienced hardships and dark times and what enabled them to get through it. So I encourage you to listen, and uh, it will be an incredible blessing to you. Uh, hello, FBC family. We're here to give our testimony uh, that we've, we've experienced in our 63 uh, and a half or 64 years or close, getting close to that, years of marriage. We have had uh, many, many uh, opportunities, I guess you might say. Trials. Uh, trials. Uh, uh, hardships, hardships. Whatever you want to call them. But uh, one of the things I think sustained, sustained both of us during the, those times were that that God was, God was in it with us. And so we never saw it as uh, a big deal. Uh, we never saw it as trials or hardships. Yes. It was just life. And we just, we felt really blessed to be a part of it and to share in, in these kinds of things. Um, we we want to give you one example. We could give you many, but we're going to give you one example that uh, we feel uh, exemplifies some of that. Uh, we uh, purchased a house in 1999 uh, on uh, a hill in Kelso, Washington. And uh, that was our first retirement home. <laughs> We've had several since, but uh, first retirement home. And uh, we stayed there for about two and a half years while I was doing my residency and Reen was uh, involved. Uh, she ran a assistance living uh, uh, house there. Uh, and it, during that process, it was, it, was, it was a great experience and we were happy there in Kelso. And, uh, but uh, after uh, three years of rain, uh, that house uh, happened to be on a, an ancient slide. And so uh, that house and about uh, over 100 other homes uh, were destroyed. Uh, were during, sliding down the hill. Yeah, it was destroyed. Some literally slid down the hill. Ours was on top, and so it uh, had some damage you know, the, the, to the foundation, uh, to the ceilings, uh, started falling. And so we uh, were uh, forced to move out of the house. The, the, the city condemned of the whole area because they couldn't keep the utilities going. Correct. It was too difficult. Yes. Uh, as a, as a, a result of that experience, uh, we, we uh, actually lost our whole, uh, our whole house. and uh, Financially. Uh, financially, it was devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a really great thing that happened as a result of that is FEMA came in and and uh, actually uh, uh, declared it a national disaster. Yes. And they gave us uh, 30 cents on the dollar. Now, some of you would say that's probably not very good. Well, it really wasn't, but it was better than nothing. And we moved to uh, Kenmore, Washington, where... Uh, I took a job. Reen took another job. That's the reason we moved. And I uh, uh, would, you know, served in my, my uh, first uh, jobs in, uh, in what I was doing at the time. 
And uh, oh, we uh, sold that house uh, and chose to move again uh, two and a half years later. And the housing values had appreciated enough that uh, we ended up. Uh, I would like to in, um, interject at this point that one reason why this didn't seem to bother us so much is that we took the attitude or had the attitude that uh, we, we didn't own the house, that it was God's. Mm -hmm. And that he, he had the right to take it, but we enjoyed it while we had it. Yes. So a, a, few, a few more moves, we ended up back here, but um, that, that particular time when we moved to Tacoma, Washington, and we bought another home and paid cash for it. So we were extremely grateful for all that had happened and that we were back into home ownership, which was something that uh, we, uh, uh, and paid for it. So we were very, very grateful for that. But in our, in our life and all the things we've uh, de dealt with, uh, God has always been there and so we're really grateful for it. And uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share this. good you are good when there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death has lost its sting oh i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your more than my words will ever say you are lord you are lord all creation will proclaim you are here you are here in your presence i made whole you are god you are god of all else i'm letting go oh. 